Hello Church. It is a, a beautiful challenging day as it's rainy when I'm recording this and that always makes staying inside a little more difficult because it feels a little bit constricted or more constricted than usual. I have a text for you today. I'd like you to have your Bibles ready. It comes out of James chapter 1 and it's going to be verses 2 through 8 and I want to focus on at least the sections that are really applicable to our situations right now. Uh, James actually captures something that I think fits perfectly in our situation. And uh, in this particular section, as uh, I read, as I turn to it and read it to you, I want you to be encouraged, but also challenged. Starts off this word in these words, James chapter one, verse two, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. Double-mindedness is an interesting word. It has a, uh, I only recorded a few times in the whole Bible, but it means to have two spirits in you, kind of warring one with another. Uh, there's, there's this side of me that I think I am and a side of me that really shows up under pressure. And so here James says how lucky, how fortunate, how joyful we should actually be when we fall into a temptation. Because in the middle of the temptation, God is giving us an opportunity to be tested so that we can pass the test. So that we can be successful, so that our faith can grow, that we can be challenged in such a way. That we begin to grow more in confidence and not less in confidence. I... Uh, recognize in that first verse in verse two there it says in all diverse ways that we can fall into it there's not just a single temptation there's a temptation to boredom there's a temptation to anger there's a temptation to be frustrated there's a temptation to drink there's a temptation and you fill it in yourself we are caught in the middle of all kinds of strange things as a culture and a country right now and those temptations can come from various directions. The way our children behave, uh, a situation with how our spouse talks to us, a frustration for being alone and just dealing with fear and the temptation of, of just grieving the loss of friendships that we're not able to be touched, held, or talked to in any of the normal ways, not to mention some of this, the fun things that we enjoy doing, certainly. But he goes on and he says this, when we are in the middle of these temptations, God's not separated from us. God hasn't left us. Instead, there is this working that he's trying to do. It's like lifting weights. The first time you lift a certain weight, you begin to go, this is too much. And by the next time, third time, fifth time, tenth time, you not only lift that weight, but you can even lift beyond it. The same thing is true as we work this in our faith. And so, this attitude that he presents uh, to us comes in that verse 3 as he goes on to say, knowing that the testing or the trial that your faith is going through is going to have an object objective to it. And that objective, as you pick out in this text, is to have cheerful endurance. The word patience in the Greek implies a cheerful enduring and enduring means it's not pleasant. Patience implies I'm uncomfortable, but I'm going to deal with it cheerfully. And so that becomes that fascinating reality that we begin to understand. God is working a cheerful endurance in us in the middle of what we're going through. Now, when we begin to understand that, it goes further to say, God's real objective in the middle of these kinds of trials that we're going through now, not to mention the norm, more normal trials of life and difficulty and work and everything else that we have to do. These trials are actually able to give us an ability to mature, to grow, to become stronger. The first time someone 
uh, runs a marathon. I've read a few stories where they say I could hardly make it around the block. And then a week later, they were running six blocks. And a week after that, they were running a mile and then two and three. And they finished a marathon or a half marathon because what they did is one step after the other. The same thing is true in our spiritual walk with God. There is a uh, these baby steps that have to be taken, but each one makes us stronger, makes us fuller, gives us all the things that God is trying to give to us. And the idea, of course, is that we are, the word is perfected, but it really means complete, that we're not having uh, any holes in our personality or our character, that we're able to put up with difficulty, whether it comes from a spouse, whether it comes from a child, we have a different kind of patience, and it's a patience that relies upon God. It's a patience that rests comfortably and fully on the awareness that God is working in the middle of these situations. And so we have this beautiful example of what God is setting up here for us in the book of James. On the second half of this text that we're coming out of in James chapter 1, now identifies a characteristic of people who are struggling, and this fits all of us in some degree or another. This word that is used there is the word double-minded. In the Old Testament, you hear examples of it when uh, Elijah uh, was confronting the children of Israel and asking them this question, are you going to worship God or are you going to worship Baal? And on that particular situation, that was his confrontation, and it says this in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. And in the concept of idolatry, we think how silly that the Israelites would not follow God. But the challenge for us is far more difficult. Do you trust God in terms of the situation we're in right now? Do you trust God with your future? Do you trust God with your dating life? Do you trust God with a variety of things that are so critically important and so different? Our bales are all different. There isn't this singular God that we fall down and worship made out of stone. There are these gods that we've set up in our mind or our heart, and we have this double-mindedness. We have this ability, I trust God, but I also trust my pocketbook. I trust God, but I will, you know, rely on something else at the same time. And so as certain things are taken away, which is really the miracle of the virus, just about everything in one sense is diminished in value. We are limited to our houses. We are limited in many ways to where we can and move and everything else like that. And all of those situations put pressure on what is it you trust what are you going to rely on? And this is this fantastic time that we're in. And so another example comes out of the book of Isaiah where God says to the people, the Lord says, or Isaiah says to the people, the Lord says, these people come near me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of the rules taught by men. This is a dilemma that people experience, and it's the same thing that we're reading now and studying in the book of James. And so I want you to look at this next verse, verse 5, chapter 1, verse 5 of James. It says, if you lack wisdom, if you lack the ability to recognize what's happening, if you don't get this yet, if you can't understand why am I sitting home alone, why am I struggling with different things in my life, I want you to understand, it says, Ask God because he wants to pour out wisdom, understanding, revelation into your life abundantly. This is the challenge for us because we want something else from the external to take care of us. And instead, there is this moment, me alone with God, confronting the realities of who and what I am. And God says, now, ask me. I want to pour this into your life. And the word is bountifully, super abundantly, more than you could possibly ask or comprehend. And so it says, without reviling, which means there's going to be no, there's no jabbing, there's no poking, there's no pushing your buttons. I want to do this for your life. I want you to have a different kind of strength 
when we come out of these weeks or months or however long it's going to be. I want you to be a different man, woman, or child than you are going into this whole virus situation. And it says this, it will be given to him. And so one of the challenges we have is, and I always like to picture it as, there are things that have to be emptied out of us, which is our self-pride, our self-confidence, our, our self-assurance, our belief that we have everything under control. And as that empties out of our minds or our hearts, God is able to pour by the power of his spirit, wisdom and discernment and understanding into us. And so I have to recognize, first, I lack wisdom. And then second, that God wants to pour wisdom in. But if there's nowhere in my life, my heart, my mind, for God to pour his truth and his wisdom, that cannot enter my life. And then it finishes off with this little thought. It says, for let not a man think... <clears throat> Let me finish it up there, read in the original over here first, excuse me. Uh, that a man should think he will receive anything from the Lord if he is like a man who doubts, tossed back and forth like a wave on the sea. And so you begin to understand this little phrase. God gives this little example of how easy it is to compare us to a small ship, small boat, being tossed back and forth by waves that are driven by the wind. And if you've ever been in a small boat, the wind will drive you and push you as well as the waves, and you have zero control of your life, which is our situation in some ways right now, which is what is so frightening, challenging, difficult, or whatever word you want to use. And then he finishes off. It says, that man should not think he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's double-minded unstable in all that he does. Now, double-minded means I have a spirit that leans on God, and I have a portion of my life or a spirit in my life that doesn't want to lean on God at all, that questions everything about God. Why? Why? Why is this happening? Why are you letting me deal and have to deal with this? Why is this happening to me financially, emotionally, spiritually? We're all concerned. I was listening the other day, and someone was saying, when you buy groceries, bring them home, wipe them down, put them on one counter, and wipe them all down, or empty the food into packages you have at home, disperse the packages, and then wipe that all down, and then wipe. And they're explaining this, and you realize this spirit of fear is real easy for us to enter into. We become afraid of this and that or something else. And yet at the same time, there's wisdom in what the individual was trying to tell us. Do this and you minimize the op op opportunity of the virus to enter your house. Throw this other stuff out right away and you can count on those cans, those boxes, those things that you've purchased to be basically free from anybody who has handled them or sneezed on them or anything else that might have happened in the store. But this double-mindedness is really fascinating. Now, Jesus said this, double-mindedness, and explained it this way. No man, can, no one, can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or to be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon stuff. And so Jesus, fully aware of what we are dealing with, recognize it and just explained it just a little bit differently. The reality is, while we can sometimes verbalize, I love God, I serve God, I'm a Christian after God's own heart, the reality is, as we look at our actions and we look at our reactions, we actually see something very different. We see the inconsistencies. And sometimes we're afraid of seeing those things. And I go, if I can't recognize the weakness, the frailty, or the inconsistency in my life, I can't repent of it, I can't agree with God's perception, I find myself falling short of what God is trying to teach me in these moments. And so I want to suggest to you that God is really kind of telling us this truth. Don't be afraid of temptations. Let the temptation come in your life, but then beat it. Let the power of God and the Holy Spirit overcome it with you so that you understand. Jesus, when he was tempted, quoted scripture. You have the power to quote scripture to understand Satan or the temptation, whether it comes from within your own heart or is demonically generated. You have this ability to overcome it. 
And if you overcome it in the power of Christ, you win. You find out I've lifted a heavier weight. And here's the best part. I've dumped some of the junk in my life and I've emptied it out. And God is filling it up with his power and his presence. Pray with me if you would as we go into this last minute or so. Lord Jesus, help me to recognize my sin and my inconsistencies. Help me to see the stupidity of my fears and anxieties. And at the same time, Lord, help me to understand you are waiting to pour into me life and hope and purpose and meaning to even the most lonely moment I'm in right now, even the greatest struggle I'm in the middle of right now. Help me, Lord, to have this moment and use it for your glory. Come and fill my life. Come and own my life and guide me in all things. I pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. Be encouraged today.